Right, okay, we can at least start talking. Um, we are here talking about Drupal and QA, the testing process, Drupal limitations, and satisfying customer expectations. I hope everybody's in the right place. And also, I hope I'm in the right place, you know, in the right room delivering this. Um, what we're going to do is talk about just quality. Um, we'll be talking a little at a higher level about what quality is rather than, you know, focusing on actual specific testing methodologies, testing techniques, which are changing heavily from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. In Drupal 8, you can do a lot more testing that's already within Drupal 8 instead of doing what a developer here told me is basically BHAT, Selenium, and Gherkin, and cross your fingers. So we'll do a lot, you can do a lot more with Drupal 8 rather than the cross your fingers and hope for the best. But we're gonna talk at a little higher level about what quality is. First of all, who am I? My name is, well, it's pronounced like it's spelled. Anastasios Daskalopoulos, um, email dosco at xov.fi. Um, this has been my nickname since I was like four or five. So dosco is what I go by. Um, A.N. Dosco, and here we are at DrupalCon Dublin 2016. It's been great for me. I hope you've enjoyed it also. Well, let's talk about quality, um, software quality. And also, um, I like to turn these things into conversation. So if you have something to say, just pipe up. And I have to admit, these lights make it difficult to see everybody. So please just shout out if you have anything to say, if you have anything to contribute, if you completely disagree, that's actually great with me too. But let's talk about quality. Um, first of all, what do we mean by software quality? A lot of people who develop don't even really think about quality. The whole, pro the whole point is to simply just get something out the door, get something to the end users, and go on to the next thing. But quality is something you have to think about throughout the entire process, and it's not something handed over to testers at the end. Um, we'll be going through this with the whole idea of continuous testing as part of the continuous integration. And we'll be talking about all this. So again, to answer the question, what do we mean by software quality? Software that functions according to the requirements of developers and to the needs of the intended users. I'm talking about this a little more. Um, this definition we give, it sounds like an easy path to satisfy both creators and customers, but as we know, things go very wrong very often. Um, what do we do? Do we contribute this to developer carelessness, poor management? Do things just go wrong in software development? Yes, they do go wrong. Um, I found a bug, cool. Um, or can software just be described as lemony, like that one bad car that comes off the assembly line? Um, or do things get developed wrong? Um, is there anything we can do to make sure that software functions in the way that both we, meaning those involved in the software development process, and the end users who actually employ the software um, and who pay for the software can use. Um, but first, I wanted to talk a little, about, a little bit about the word bug. What do we mean by bug? What is a bug? Um, okay, interesting, this isn't changing. That's cool. I found a bug. Now, to us, bugs are good things. OK, 
Okay, cool. Finally. Okay, so the word bug first appeared um, in a letter from Thomas Edison in 1878. Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, um, phonograph, motion pictures, numerous other things. Um, he used bug in the same way that we basically do. Okay, he says, it has been just so in all of my inventions. The first step is an intuition and comes with a burst, then difficulties arrive. This thing gives out and it is then that bugs, as such little faults and difficulties are called, show themselves. And months of intense watching, study and labor are requisite before commercial success or failure is certainly reached. Okay, so he used in 1878 the word bug in the same way we do. Um, there's another story, of, which apparently came later, that the word bug came from um, experiments in the late 40s in Washington, D.C., back when computers used to be like really big room-sized mechanical devices. Apparently, at one point, a moth, literally a bug got stuck in a mechanical relay and that basically crashed. Well, we use the, the word crash also is a mechanical term that comes from these early computers when the, when the equipment, the physical gears would literally crash. But that moth that got stuck actually stopped the entire computer. And interestingly enough, if you go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., you can actually see that moth preserved under tape. They actually kept it still, so you can actually see it. But, so we can see for almost 150 years, people who build things, meaning new, as of yet unused technological things, have had to worry about the little faults and difficulties, as Edison refers to them. And it's interesting to see that such a successful inventor, as we would call him today, an entrepreneur such as Edison, realized that removing the bugs, as he called them, the little faults, in other words, um, is a long and difficult process that often take months to, er to eradicate, to get rid of. Um, before we move on to this, um, I found out something a little bit knowing where we are about the etymology of the word bug. Apparently, bug actually goes back to Celtic. Um, an early Celtic root meaning a threat, or something like an unknown threat. And I find it interesting that this, what would you call it, an atavistic, preternatural, basically supernatural, unknown threat usage, is basically what haunts us today in software development. So the word bug just meant like unknown kind of spooky threat. Um, this obviously, this apparently gives us the word like bogey. Um, even the word like boogeyman comes from this whole same idea of just an unknown threat, just a threat out there. And speaking of threats, um, has this happened to anybody's phone yet? Has anyone? You've seen word of this. You've seen this on the news, right? This is the Galaxy S7 in action. Um, I'm very, I have to tell you, I don't know if this happened on your flight, but before I came here on thin air, the, the stewardess came on the intercom system and said, if anybody has a Galaxy S7, please come see them as, as soon as possible before the flight takes off. Now, the way I see it is if your product isn't allowed on an airline flight, then there's something wrong with your QA process. Um, actually, how this got past testing, I really don't know. Um, I'm just curious if something just didn't, somebody just didn't notice this happening to the telephone. Um, was it not in the requirements? I kind of know testers who probably wouldn't say anything because this, the phone catching on fire wasn't in the requirements. So let's just, let's just pass it and go on. Um, it really just boggles my mind. I know in the U.S. every single one of these have had to be recalled. 
Um, and I know they test for this because when I was at Nokia, I had friends of mine who were um, physical testers. They were hardware device testers who would do things like drop telephones from certain heights to see what would happen. Um, they would throw, they would spray them with water, throw them in a, in a container of water for a number of minutes. And they would also set them on fire, too. They would try to set them on fire. But it, was, it wasn't just destruction or vandalism. They were actually engineering to see exactly where the failure is and where the point of failure is. Apparently, the point of failure um, comes somewhere in the battery. Apparently, a, li a battery lining breaks surprisingly easy, and the phone catches on fire. And I have to tell you, when I was um, testing Windows 5, this was about 10 years ago, using an HTC device, I noticed something similar to this. When you were live streaming, you physically couldn't hold the HTC device for more than 20 minutes before it got too hot to hold. Literally, it would just get too hot. I did want to see if it would start smoking or catching on fire, but it didn't. It just got too hot. So these things happen, um, and they happen even more. Um, I got this news actually last night. This is another Galaxy device. This is another Samsung. This is the Samsung Note 7, a different device. Okay, just like with the Galaxy S7, 7 doesn't seem to be a lucky number for the Samsung company. Um, so if you have a Note 7, um, just use a different phone or let it run down or just keep being careful about what happens when you plug in. Or you can just set it on fire and see what happens. That, 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 that's what I do. Um, but there are other bugs out there. Um, we're just going to talk a few minutes about some more because these things, I'm showing big examples of the problems that can happen. These are all bugs that have been released, very disastrous bugs that have actually gone out in the wild. Um, let's find Melbourne, Australia. According to Bing Maps, where is Melbourne, Australia? Yeah, it's somewhere off the coast of Japan. Um, this was released uh, a few months ago. Um, two things surprised me about this. Well, three things, counting the location of Melbourne, Australia, according to Bing Maps. Um, this was apparently blamed on Wikipedia. Um, this was caused by an error in coordinates by Wikipedia. It surprises me that Microsoft uses Wikipedia APIs and that they can get things so wrong. Um, other examples? Um, I first got into this business through aerospace, through aviation. So a lot of these things are going to be aviation and aerospace related. Um, the 1962 Mariner 1 only lasted like about one minute because of a mathematical error and the way probably coding and software at the time couldn't really um, represent certain mathematical things. This was the overbar in physics. Um, after five minutes, the Mariner 1 had to be manually, well, just blown up. A little, something a little more recent. You may have read about this, but the 1998 Mars Climate Orbiter this is the problem with imperial versus metric measurements. Um, Lockheed Martin, the software on the ground, calculated the Mars insertion thruster firing. They're basically the little rockets that take the, the capsule from space into Mars atmosphere. They were calculated to fire in the English pound seconds. But the NASA software on the orbiter itself expected the calculation to be in metric system called Newtons. And the expected result, the orbiter broke apart in the, in the Martian atmosphere, so it's probably lying in pieces somewhere in Mars. Or maybe it missed Mars entirely and is just kind of floating in space somewhere. Um, cost $327.6 million. 
because somebody didn't um, basically look and see what are the calculations expected in. Um, a few more things. Uh, the Mars Spirit in 2004, a little more recently, um, the DOS file system caused the flash memory to fill up and it kept the rover in an endless reboot cycle. This was fixed a few weeks later, but with, at a huge cost of time and money. Again, it ran into the millions. And also the Mars Global Surveyor, values written to the wrong memory addresses force the surveyor to begin unnecessary mechanical operations that cause basically the whole thing to go into safe mode and it hasn't been contacted since. So basically when people start walking on Mars, they can go visit the global surveyor, I guess manually reboot the whole thing and it should start working again. Um, things a little closer to home, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of these. Um, the 2007 Excel problem, if you multiply 850 times 77.1, the end result was always 100,000. And similar calculations like this. Um, problem error and function that converts binary numbers to strings for displaying. The calculation was correct deep within the computer, but the problem was in the display. Displayed it as 100,000. Um, and some little tricks that still exist in software. You can try these yourself if you want free hotel rooms, free stuff. You didn't hear it here, but you can try it. Um, sometimes this was fixed in a very large, probably familiar sounding hotels, something, you know, booking error, we'll just call it like that. Um, an error in the URL display left the fee parameter in the URL field, thereby making the hotel payment up to the users to simply change the fee parameter to 0, 0.00 and getting a free hotel room. Um, you can do this with other things. Um, yeah, this one is difficult for me to see. The 2008 Google Maps error. Arlington National Cemetery outside of Washington, D.C. in Virginia um, has the icon that displays it as a restaurant. Um, horrible. In 1997, this still happens in some e-commerce. Make sure when you're developing your e-commerce sites that this doesn't happen. Customers place a negative value in the quantity field which allow the customers to get free credits at checkout. Okay, make sure that um, you can't put negatives in your field. That sometimes still happens. Um, other things, that this was in the news a lot, I remember. Um, the 2012 Apple Maps, if you've had a few drinks or something else, it pays to go to get a real mind trip. Um, there's a huge problem with scaling where roads kind of disappear, bridges kind of dip into rivers and then come out the other side. Um, numerous examples of this. Here there's a road that kind of goes in and out. It's kind of like a dolly painting, but this was the landscape in the 2012 Apple Maps. Um, they can still be found elsewhere. And a few more things. Um, having done this a lot with airplanes, um, avionics, I don't mean to make you paranoid, but avionics software is also very buggy. But there are a lot of backups, there are a lot of manual backups, which you don't have on a computer. Um, this is unfortunately one that didn't work. In 2015, the Airbus A400, a military Airbus airplane that's Supposedly, well, they're trying to get it to replace the USC-130 for military cargo and transport. And the, end, the A400 in Madrid, Spain crashed soon after takeoff because of a software bug. Apparently, in, the, in one of the engines, there are little, the avionics has like a little text file. The text file has a bunch of numbers and calculations that provide torque to the engines to get the engines to spin really, really fast and strong on takeoff. And there fly, you know, therefore the airplane goes up instead of down. 
that's the king. That's the real key. Um, and one more thing, um, a software error. I found this a few months ago. Caused a prison. Caused a release of prisoners early. An application that calculates prisoners' sentences based on good or bad behavior. For 13 years, calculated their release dates two months early, on average. There were some very violent convicts who were released years early. Of course, you're sentenced. This happened, I believe, let me see, in Washington State. Um, of course, you're sentenced to a certain amount of time, but apparently based on good behavior you can, or bad behavior, you can be let out early or kept later. Everybody got out early because of this software problem. And a little hope closer to home for Drupal 7. Um, I spotted this a few months ago um, on simply a C run stop on Vagrant. I'm seeing if this can be reduced, I mean reproduced on, Wind on Drupal 8. Um, but notice when the last run of this was done according to this. Yeah, so this is Drupal 7. I should report this, I guess, but I just like reproducing it and seeing what happens. Everyone keeps saying how new Drupal is, but, if, but according to this, you know, last run 46 years and seven months. So Drupal has these kinds of things. Um, I like looking for these, not because I'm being sar sarcastic or trying to just find problems, but there's a certain creativity involved in finding these kind of, kinds of things. So um, we'll see if this happens on. I'll have to put the same command on Drupal 8 and see if we get the same result. But to give you a, uh, an idea of the cost, these aren't just silly little jokes, silly little matters that can be easily fixed. Um, these cost a lot of money. This figure came um, last month from Better Software magazine. It's like a trade journal for software testing. Um, the cost of bugs to public companies from 2012 to 2014, the last numbers, was $2.3 billion with a B, that is, um, of shareholder value lost on the day of software bugs announcements. Okay, so somebody actually calculated on the day a big bug is, count, is announced in the press, how far does the stock value of a company go down? If you add it up, it goes to $2.3 billion from 2012 to 2014. Um, one thing I'm saying here, software bugs are increasingly becoming more frequent and consequently more costly. I think bugs have obviously always existed from the day that the moth got stuck in the mechanical computer um, all the way to what we see now. Um, bugs are becoming increasingly, maybe not more frequent, but the reporting of them is more frequent. We know more about them. And we know more about them. And so, as the article says, as software becomes more and more ubiquitous, you know, with the Internet of Things and all that, um, software development methods on their own are proving less and less reliable. Maybe a little extreme statement, but something to kind of get your point that um, more and more bugs are being released and more and more bugs are being reported. And so there's a bigger and bigger threat to what is going on in the software that we're releasing. And this is something that happens to Drupal also. Um, Drupal has, shall we call it, limitations. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good system, as we all know, but it does have limitations. And what we're going to get to after some more talk about what quality is. Um, we're going to talk about how we can work within these Drupal limitations to satisfy customer requirements. And what I've done over the past few months to get things to pass, to make the customer happy despite Drupal's limitations. 
Well, let's talk about quality. What do we mean by quality? Um, quality you can get now. The point of what I'm going to try to say is the whole idea of continuous testing. There's a whole idea of continuous integration, continuous development, and especially with Drupal 8 now, you can, all, you can do continuous testing too, which is not set apart from continuous development. It's whole part of the integration process. Integration, meaning like development and testing are happening all the time. They're happening in parallel. It's not like you develop and then you test your developing and testing all at the same time. So what do we need? Well-defined business requirements. Um, we'll talk about how or even if business requirements help. Um, biz specific business-related defects are prioritized for test cases and fixing. And especially repeated regression test automation sets to verify bug fixes and also to detect other bugs. You're not just going through and testing what is passed. You're always looking for bugs in test automation. And you're always maintaining the scripts. You're always editing the scripts. You're basically changing everything. You're changing the scripts in test automation to test the changes in the, in the software itself. Um, I heard once, and I have to agree with, in test automation, the actual script creation isn't that big of a deal. A really good tester, a test automation tester, we've had some good speeches here so far. Um, a good automation tester is good at maintaining the scripts, not just creating them, but maintaining. The whole point of test automation is not to get the green light, it's to find bugs. A good script finds bugs. A good script doesn't pass, a good script finds bugs. It's that mentality that I'd like to get everyone to change. Um, what is a successful test pass? To me, a successful test is something that finds bugs. I've gotten in trouble over the years with this. Because development managers will say, did the test runs go well? And I, I would respond, yes. And they, they say, good, everything works then. My answer was, no, you know, things don't work. That's a successful test. I found a lot of bugs. You know, that's a successful test round to me. So we have to make sure we're on the right page. You know, if there weren't any bugs found, I would think I'm doing something wrong. So yes, I've gotten my share of grief because I do find bugs, but you know, it's my job to kind of piss people off. You know, there are bugs, you know. Things don't work. People often say, okay, Dosco, the software's ready, now try and break it. The thing that I always have to say is I don't have to try and break it. Because generally, it's already broken. You know. So we have that attitude. Um, don't get me wrong. I like to break things. You know, I'm very bad at ordering things um, through the web because I end up crashing the e-commerce form. You know, that's just what I do. Um, maybe I break things, and to me, that's good. You know, I've always enjoyed breaking things, and I, I love this job. I get to break things. Um, let's talk about some ideas about what is software quality and things to keep in mind as you're developing. Um, software quality, the elusive target, um, has this article has five perspectives regarding software quality. And again, let's, let's talk about this. If you agree or disagree, let's talk about this. Um, the first perspective, manufacturing. Software quality is the capability of a software product to, per, to conform to requirements. Okay, that sounds good. Just the capability of software products to conform to requirements. Um, to me, this statement is kind of a hedge because to to obtain quality, all the software has to do is conform to requirements. Um, as we know, anyone who's actually out of work in developing software, so much can go wrong, 
And there are so many repeated changes to an extent that it's difficult to just conform to requirements. Um, in the end, yes, we do have to conform to requirements, whatever those may turn out to be. But simply to just conform to requirement is no guarantee that the software does work. I have had development managers, and I've worked with development managers that will say in the end, yes, we've satisfied the requirements, we're done, it's released, next project. Um, but again, this may not be what the end user wants. Um, just because it conforms to requirements doesn't mean it's not still full of bugs. You can't just conform to requirements and release unless you change those requirements. Um, going on, this is an, inter an interesting perspective. It's, it's what they call the transcendental view of quality. Quality is something towards which we strive as an ideal, but may never implement completely. Um, this is close to paraphrasing what the US Supreme Court Justice David Potter said in 1966 regarding obscenity. An obscenity case, apparently in, the, in 1966, went all, went all the way to the Supreme Court. It had to do with the film by the French director Louis Malle, I believe it was. Um, a movie theater manager was even jailed because of sh he was shown, um, he was convicted of showing porn, and his case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And how this case was settled was the justice David Potter said regarding this, the same regarding quality. The fact is, you know it when you see it. How do you know you have quality? You know it when you see it. Maybe some things just can't be defined. It's like, how do you define a good movie? Or even other things, how do you define a good pizza? You know, you, you just know it. So even with good software in this view, you just know it when you see it. You can't pigeonhole it. There's no way to define the essence of good software. Um, going on with these in the context of use, I like this one. Um, it's, a, like it says, a very concrete down-to-earth definition based on the simple concept of are the customers happy? Does production software fulfill customer needs? Are the end users, that is the paying customers, happy with the software they're using? Are you getting complaints? Are sales numbers going up? If you're not complaining, if you're not getting any complaints, if things are selling, well, yeah, you have good software. That, that's one thing about software testing. Um, basically, we know we've done a good job pretty much when nothing happens. If there aren't any crashes reported, if there aren't any complaints, then we've done our job. Often the credit, we don't really mind this, often the credit goes to development because the developers, of course, have done a good job in developing good, um, easy to find software. But it's also our job to find all these bugs. So basically, we, we've done a good job when nothing happens, um, when just good things happen. Are, are there few complaints? Some people will always complain, is the software selling? Um, that's the context of use. And we'll be getting back to this whole idea. Um, this is the view called the product. Product can be a, quality can be appreciated by measuring the inherent characteristics of the product. In other words, the quality of the product is simply measured by what it says it can do. If the product performs the task, then yes, it's a high quality product. Um, I would agree with this, of course, but there's another way of looking at things. Um, is this, it may be a high quality product, but is it what the end user really wants? We can look at high quality products in other fields. For example, like look at the, let's just say the Ferrari Italia. A high quality product. Um, very fast, very reliable. But what if you need 
to haul a load of firewood to the camping site. Then the Ferrari Italia is not going to do very much good. Um, yes, it can be a high quality product, but you ultimately have to satisfy the user requirements. And the last thing here is the value-based perspective. This perspective recognizes that the different perspectives of quality may have different importance or value to various stakeholders. Okay, we may find, we may develop a great piece of software, but if it's not what a customer can actually use, then the value of the software ultimately is very low. And yes, very buggy. An example of this that I remember from my own experience is that there was a, let's say, I shouldn't use names, but a very large Nordic saw, um, shopping, let's just say a mall, not to use any, not to give anything away, but uh, several subcontractors were hired to do the retail software at this large Nordic department store. And the software was basically released, but it was so difficult to use like the, the store workers, the actual end users, the actual store workers weren't able to use it. It was just too complicated for the workers to actually use. The company that developed it basically said, well, it's not our problem if people don't know what they're doing. So the whole point here is, yes, it is your problem. You have to have software that people can use. That's a good thing that Drupal does because it does provide software that people can use, but you have to keep in mind that, you know, let people use it. Don't make it too complicated. Okay, but moving on quickly to actual Drupal problems. I'm just going to skip quickly here to some more concept of quality um, to keep in mind. This is what I would like everyone to keep in mind. Quality is a customer determination, not an engineer's determination, not a marketing determination, nor really a management determination. It's based on the customer's actual experience with the product or service measured against his or her requirements, stated or unstated. Okay, and always representing a moving target in a competitive market. Okay, so your software has to be what people can actually use. Um, another author who writes about this very quickly, quality has multiple meanings. Quality consists of those product features which meet the need of customers and thereby provide product satisfaction, which we've been saying. Also, for us, quality consists of the freedom from deficiencies. Nevertheless, in this definition, such as it is convenient to standardize on a short definition, the word quality is fitness of use. Can you use something? Um, as we've seen from the Galaxy S7 and Note 7, you can't even use it. There's some products out there you can't even use. And customers need to use everything well. But going on a little more, let's skip around. Um, actually, let's just get to Drupal. I want to I want to get to this point before we run out of time. Um, I've, as a tester, as a QA guy, I've always found myself to be the voice of the customer, the voice of the end user. Yes, the voice of management, the voice of the requirements writers, the voice of the stakeholders. But ultimately, I try to be the voice of the customer who's ultimately using it. Um, to me, ultimately, in the end, we develop software for the person at home. Um, software de development is all about satisfying the needs of the end user. So we'll look at some examples in a few minutes to see what, can Dr what Drupal does and does not do to satisfy end user requirements. Um, to this end, I guess, like I say, we have to find out what the customer wants in order to fill one part of the software quality duality known as verification and validation. 
Just very quickly, validation is do you have the right system? Verification, does the system work right? All right, often that doesn't happen. Um, going on, like I say, um, verification system right versus right system. Validation, we have to know what the end users really want. Often this gets lost during the development process when numerous changes have to happen, numerous things have to be developed, we have to start over again, we forget about the end user. So never forget about what the end user actually wants. And also we have to remember, does the end user actually get a working product? <coughs> Okay, um, moving on, um, in terms of just DevOps, um, this is where we come into play. Um, this whole world of quality assurance and software test testing has been changing a lot. It's changed a lot when I started. When I started, I was at a Nokia office, I guess in South Central Finland, in a big room with like 40 other people, all with like Word documents in hand, all basically doing the same steps at the same time. Um, that is old history now. This was in like 2003. Um, things are changing. There basically just isn't time to do that kind of testing anymore. There isn't the money to do that kind of testing anymore. So in DevOps, we define it as a method in which we can more confidently evaluate our products continuously to understand the risks associated with it at any point in time. Um, this definition just calls it a risk. Uh, that's the funny thing about the software testing industry. In QA, um, very often the word bug, issue, the media likes to use the term glitch. Um, actually, for legal purposes, we, we're not really using the word defect anymore because defect means you're releasing defective, law, uh, defective software, and guess what? You're becoming um, liable to legal problems, legal hassles. So we use those words interchangeably. Um, and I've been a big fan of QA independence. Um, it's, a, it's a bad idea to have somebody be a developer and a tester. You really can't just change hats. You can't first be the developer and then the tester. You can't do, now I'm the developer, now I'm the tester. Um, you need a little bit of independence. You need to be able to step back because often two people are too close to their own software. A lot of developers don't want to find bugs in their own software. Um, they don't want to assign bugs in their own software to other developers. Um, the way I see it, bugs are a good thing. In fact, in, in Japan, in the whole Toyota process that's been written about for, yeah, for a few years now, workers who find a problem on the assembly line are financially rewarded. Um, that was a problem with the U.S. auto industry where often a worker who found a problem was blamed for somehow causing the problem. Um, we get that too in software development. Like I said earlier, often we're not very popular, but um, in, a development, in a good development environment, we're, we're needed, we're necessary. We become very, prob we become very popular because we, we point out the problems. Okay, I'm getting to the thing, oh yeah, this is one problem I've always had. All bugs have to be fixed. Um, really, there's no such thing as a minor bug. All bugs have a deleterious effect on the end user. There's a big problem um, known as incremental degradation. It's defined as the result of tiny progressive reductions in the quality of a product or a service. In other words, um, if you allow one minor bug to be released, then you'll allow, you'll allow another minor bug, and then another minor bug, and then another minor bug. 
And often what happens there, the severity of those minor bugs become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you have like a huge crash, a blow up. Actually, this idea started from the 1986 Challenger space shuttle disaster, when basically um, there were numerous bugs in the Challenger's system. But the engineers thought, well, we've got all, everything still works fine, even though we have all these bugs. What's one little problem extra? And as you see, all those little problems will add up to one big major problem. I've read that, for example, Hewlett Packard, 40% of all customer complaints come from what we call minor bugs. So minor bugs are things that have to be fixed just as much as major bugs. As, as developers, I want you to get that mindset in. If it's easy to fix, then just fix it. Everybody's happy. Um, there are two types of bugs, two types of software bugs. One is the software bug specifically. Bugs that result from a coding error or some other machine produced error. And then there are the user expectation bugs. Um, some little things like design error, text or field overlaps, misalignment, they're both bad. They both um, are threats to, soft, to customer requirements, um, customer satisfaction. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to see a few slides from Drupal, Drupal 7, and I, we're going to debate on are these bugs or not. But they show the limits of Drupal as what we found in our things. There are some NDAs that keep me from actually showing you certain bugs, but I'll describe them as much as possible. But we're going to see are these bugs or not. And also, like I say here, there's no clear-cut definition of a bug. What is a bug? I don't know. Nobody knows. There, there's no real definition of a bug that everybody's really, um, really agreed on. The best one I found is any unexpected or undesired software behavior. Agree or disagree? Um, but let's look at a few things before we wrap up. Um, here, this is a lift up that's supposed to start a YouTube film. All you have to do is push the play button. Can we find the play button? Play button? Especially if you're a user who's just scrolling down. Play button. Apparently it's kind of in here, maybe somewhere. Um, also, there's text here. That's not an error. That's the Finnish language, so don't worry about that. Um, this was resolved when um, this was actually going to be released, but I, I objected to this because nobody can actually see that this is supposed to have a this is supposed to play an animation. Um, so I had the I reported this, and fortunately everything was darkened a little bit, and later released to customer satisfaction. Um, here's another problem. I think this is a problem. Does anyone have a problem with this lift up? There's something that bothered me about this picture. Again, I didn't like, I didn't want this to be released because to me this is a buggy lift up. And the bug I found is, look, look at... What's your definition of a lift up? What's a lift up? Um, it's, it's just, it's something in the Drupal that, that's a picture that has a link here um, in a, a main page. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was supposed to be a link. There was supposed to be a link here. The problem I had is look at the sailor's head. I don't like the headless sailor here. Um, luckily, this was later resolved. Actually, one big Drupal limitation that unfortunately I couldn't show you is we had this one um, customer that had a lot of thumbnail images. The thumbnail images never were supposed to show like a person's head. 
but the thumbnails just showed like parts of people's heads. That just looked really weird. Um, we resolved that problem by basically just getting rid of the thumbnail images. So these are the problems here. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. Um, this was a weird, this was actually a customer complaint. The customer said the button is not green enough. Um, so what did we do? This is a, an example of a client dissatisfaction. So it's kind of up to us to figure out like what does a not green enough button mean? Yes, we had a green button. I passed the case because there was a green button, the button was green, but the customer wasn't satisfied. There was something wrong. And so the client satisfaction occurred because apparently they were expecting a greener button and the solution was maybe a dark greener button was added with more easily read text that replaced the earlier button and apparently that was okay. Okay, so um, these things will quickly um, be more easily done in Drupal 8. You can use test-driven development where everything's based on the tests first. Um, and also, same thing with the unit testing. Um, PHP unit is very inter well integrated into Drupal 8, so you can use it to um, do not just unit te testing, but also with functional tests, as we've had other um, presentations here. And just in summary, I just want to let you know that I found that quality is an elusive and difficult to define aspect of software development, but one that we ultimately need to find. This is what's part of the bug hunt. This is part of the hunt. Okay? We have to hunt for quality. You have to actually seek it out. It doesn't just happen. And one that ultimately must satisfy end user expectations and needs. And the last thing is the job of quality assurance to work besides but independently of development to both validate and verify the software to make sure that Drupal develops the right system so the customers will have a system that works right. And with that, go out, develop, start with Drupal 8, start with all the great things that will let you test your, your applications with Drupal 8, and good luck and have fun with it. Okay? I'm done. Thanks. Uh, sure. If anybody has any questions, hardly anybody, no one ever does, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to. So, so questions for participating here, Wesley. So you made a point actually about being the voice of, of the client. Yes. has moved into more agile ways of, of actually working due to those very same reasons that you're outlining there. So you have user stories which um, instead of being requirements they have they have a user perspective and their role is to actually make sure that a developer could get uh, that, that user perspective and have the acceptance criteria. I mean wouldn't 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 that be a solution uh, instead of yeah. to the testing engineers to actually get that perspective in? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's part of the, the part, it's the part of the test engineers to be a part of that system also. Yeah. So. I mean, essentially, yeah, if you work in Scrum, the whole idea is that the whole team sort of is part of that planning process and the, 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 the refinement of the backlog and writing and creating user stories. So essentially, you make them uh, better and get the same message. Yes, yeah, and the, the key way within that system works within that. Right. To be the voice of the end user, yes, and also to make sure that everything's working correctly, as we said. There's a little bit of independence required. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that—that's what it does. That's the PMs. 
Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, by trying to get uh, policy, again, this is a project management. This is a point that I made quickly that I really had to go through that a developer, when I, I would ask developers, why aren't you doing more unit testing? Why don't you do this? And one developer said, well, we're not being paid to do unit tests. It's not, it's not budgeted. It's not budgeted in time and it's not budgeted in money. So if, if we would do unit testing, if we were paid to do unit testing, my problem is, you know, especially with Drupal 8, I'm not just being such a big Drupal 8 evangelist, but it is easier to, to just develop and test. You can develop the tests in parallel with what everything else you're doing. So yeah, that is ultimately a project management responsibility, but it's the job of the QA to get the project manager to do that. Um, a little bit of politics are needed and a little bit of um, the whole idea is that if you spend a little bit of time doing unit tests, like budgeting for unit tests, you don't have to use that time to do some kind of post-release bug fix re release. Um, when I first started, unfortunately, that was part of just the usual development cycle. We release and then we do a bug fix release. I thought that was nuts. You know, you don't just say, well, the, we're just going to give time to do like a post fix release. That's often needed, but to me, you have to try and reduce that or eliminate it. And one way to do that is to test as early as possible. You know, make QA part of the development process and make the unit testing part of the development process also. So you're not developing and then testing, you're kind of developing and testing all at the same time. That's my point. Okay, so if there's nothing else, you know, like I said, go out and have fun. Check out Drupal 8 and see what it can do for quality assurance.